Amen. I'm going to be in uh, 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2, starting in, starting in verse 1. says, I exhort, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. You know, uh, like I said there a minute ago, you know, prayer is important. You know, prayer is our communication with God. You know, that's our lifeline, our help, our hope, our comfort, is that communication with God. Yeah. It says in verse 1, first of all, you know, first of all tells me, you know, this is something that's important, you know, we need to listen to it. You know, how many times you hear someone say, you know, first of all, or most importantly, you know, it, it tells us, you know, hey, you might want to, you know, stop and listen right here. This is going to be important. This is something that can help you. And then right there in verse number one, it continues on, and it actually lists out types of prayers. It starts with supplications. A prayer of supplication is request for specific needs. You know, prayer requests that are made that we pray for, you know, that's specific needs that we're praying for there. Then it puts type of prayer is prayers just in general prayers which is a general prayer which can include stuff like confessions prayers of adoration love worship respect you no know, it's a generalized prayer there then it goes on it says intercessions a prayer of intercession is a prayer that you make on behalf of someone else that goes back to prayer requests. To me, that would include prayer requests again. And then it says, in the giving of thanks, you know, we should have a prayer of, it's of a prayer of thanks and of praise of, to God. You know, just think of everything that God's done for you, continues to do for you, that you've seen God do for other people. We always have something that we can thank God for. You know, even when we're having the most worst day, it seems like nothing could just go right. If we would just really look, there's something we can thank God for. You know, it may not seem like it's going our way, but God has a plan. And we should thank Him for putting His plan into place and not our place. And not our will, what we would have be done. And it says... Be made for all men. You know, it don't say just pray for yourself. It says pray for all men. Pray for one another. Yes, you have to pray for yourself. You can't count and depend on someone else to do your praying for you, to pray for you. But you, So you have to be willing to pray for yourself, but you also have to be willing to pray for one another. Pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ. 
to pray for the world, to pray for the ones that are lost. You know, it's, this is one of our duties as a Christian is to be praying for one another. It says to pray for kings and for all that are in authority. You know, we have to be willing to pray for the leaders of our country. You know, pray for the president, for the leaders. You know, we, they need our prayers. We need to be praying for them. You know, we need to be praying that they would seek God's will and seek God's guidance in what they're doing, you know. It's our job to be praying for these things. And over in verse 4 it says, Who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of truth. You know, just like I said, we're to have a burden for the lost. We're to be praying for the lost. We should have a desire to see the lost be saved, to see him come get close to God, to get in that fellowship with God that we have. Then if you look down in uh, verse number 8, it says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up, lifting up holy hands, you know, we are to pray everywhere. And, you know, we not just to pray at church, not just pray, you know, when it's convenient. You know, we should be willing to pray whenever we need to. If we're at work and we need to pray, we need to pray. If we're driving down the road, pray. If you're at church, Pray. It don't matter where you're at. You can always pray and get a hold of God. You don't have to be right here at this altar to get a hold of God. God is right there ready to listen and talk to you whenever you need Him. And it says, Without wrath and doubting. Right there is a hard one. Pray without doubting. But believing. You know, I think a lot of times when we pray, we almost pray thinking, well, this ain't going to work. It's not going to happen. You know, God ain't going to do this for me. That's not how we're supposed to pray. We're supposed to pray believing that God is going to hear our prayers, and that God is going to answer our prayers. We can't have doubt in God. You know, God is always there for us. He may not answer a prayer the way we want it answered, but God will answer your prayers. And the way He answers your prayer is the way that it needs to be answered. You know, going back to when I started, you know, I said prayer is our communication with God. You know, how many people in here could go a year without using one of these? How about a month? A week? A day? Anybody? You know, this is communication with the world. Communication with someone that will let you down. Prayer is your line of communication, your phone to reach God. You know, God is always going to be there for you. God is not going to turn his back on you, not going to say, I don't have time, not going to let you down. God is always going to be there for us. But yet, how many people in here can say they've went a day without praying? I, I know I've went times where I've went a day without praying, but yet in that day, I've picked up my phone and done something with it, talked to someone, text someone, you know, that's time that should have been given to God. You know, we need to keep that line of communication open and free-flowing with God. You know, like I said, God's not going to let you down like man will. God will, I will let you down. 
Preacher Eric can let you down. You know, Jim, as good as he is, Jim can let you down. God will never let you down. You know, so prayer, prayer is no joke. It's something that we should take very seriously and something that we should grow in. You know, prayer and communication with God can change a lot of things. Prayer, there is power in prayer. There's power in prayer and in believing in your prayer and in, belie in believing that God will answer your prayer. I wonder if anyone might have a word for the Lord this morning. That's exactly right. Very true. That's right. We sometimes will do it almost out of habit, not because we want to talk to God, but because it's a habit, something we feel like we just, well, I need to do this, I've not done it yet. Oh, he's always there. That's right. No one else has anything. We'll dismiss our classes. Morning. Morning. Alan, you want to pray for us? What James was talking about there, or praying out of habit, raise your hand if you do that sometimes. I, I catch myself doing that pretty often. And also, I, I catch myself praying and just giving God a list of things that I want or need. Anybody else ever do that? I think that God recognizes that we're putting effort into our prayer and, and that we want to have a relationship with him but I also believe that he knows their hearts and he knows it that even if we're doing it out of out of habit or out of obligation I guess would be the best word for it you know we've still got him on our mind we still want to to pray and ask him but I believe he recognizes the fact that we want a relationship with him more than that that we just pray because we love Him. You know, I try to make an effort to go down on Sunday mornings and see my mom and dad because I love them. I, I want a relationship with them. I want to be with them. And I think that God hears our prayers more when they're prayed with that kind of attitude than just, I need to dedicate 15 minutes into my prayer life today. We're going to get into uh, to Paul's prayers here in just a minute. Uh, I read part of a, a book that Billy Graham wrote, and I wanted to share a little story with you about Albert Einstein. We all know who that is. He was a 
one of the greatest minds of our time. But people write that he was an extremely unorganized person. I have read that he couldn't tie his own shoes. He couldn't drive a car. But he helped build a nuclear bomb. Uh, most of the time when he traveled, it was always by train. And in this particular story, he uh, had bought his train ticket but lost it. And he rode the train so often that the conductor knew who he was. And he said, I know who you are. I know you've paid for your ticket. Just go take your seat and we'll be on our way here in a few minutes. Well, the conductor went around and was checking everybody else's ticket. And uh, he came back and Albert Einstein was under his seat looking for his ticket. And he said, Professor Einstein, I know who you are. There's no need for you to keep looking for your ticket. And he said, yes, I know who I am too, but I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> and I thought about that quite a bit. You know, I, I am who I am. I know who I am. But through Jesus, I know where I'm going. Through the cross, He paid for my ticket. He established my destination. Whether I can show my ticket or not, He knows exactly who I am and exactly where I'm going. And I thought that could, uh, you know, that could be applied to any Christian's life today. The fact that our, our ticket has been paid. And, you know, we, we may not realize exactly what we're going to, but he knows exactly what it is and how he's going to take us there. Turn over, if you will, to 2 Corinthians. We're going to be in chapter 12. We're going to start at verse number 7. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Who's ever had a thorn in the flesh? Who still has one? This is Paul talking about his thorn in the flesh. He introduces us to it in, in verse number 7. Uh, the thorn is something that will trouble you. It irritates you. It bothers you. Uh, it's something that gets on your nerves. The Greek word for a thorn refers to a splinter or a needle of some kind. Now, we've all experienced a splinter in the hand, a splinter in the foot. And we know after a time... It might not hurt when we first get it, but the next day we know it's there, don't we? And it, it requires some kind of a hillbilly surgery to get it out of there, don't it? <laughs> I got part of this lesson from, uh, from Tony Evans, and he said that it's like a fish hook. Who's ever had a fish hook in their hand, Doug? I know you have. What happens when you pull it out of there? It tears all the flesh around that hole that it makes going in, don't it? And makes that hole three times as big. And that's what Tony Evans said that, that Paul's talking about here. When it pierces the skin, it cannot be got loose without tearing the flesh around it and making the injury much worse than what it was when it first went in. A thorn is, for today's lesson, anything that nags, irritates you, bothers you on a continuous basis. 
Uh, it's something that frustrates you ongoingly. Paul says, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. So, somebody tell me what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. Nobody in here knows, do they? Because he never says what it is. It would be a total guesswork to guess what it is. I've already told you what I think it was. Uh, some people say that it was vision problems. Some people say that it was a, a group called the Judaizers who followed him around constantly wherever he went and did nothing but undermine the word that he tried to preach. And that would be a pretty bad thorn in the flesh to a preacher, wouldn't it? Uh, some said that it could be loneliness and he does discuss his loneliness when he's talking about uh, Demas and some of the other ones who had left him and uh, left him alone but also I thought of uh, Paul didn't have a wife he didn't have a family and you know he didn't have that support that that most people do have from their from their spouse and from their family Listen to what I got written down here. Okay. Uh, we talked about that it could be some different health problem. We know that he traveled with Luke up to the end of his life. The bottom line is we simply do not know. And that's good. Why? Because you can put in your personal thorn in the flesh in that blank. Just like what you just said. What irritates you? What nags you? What frustrates you? What bothers you on a constant level? That's the thorn in the flesh that we're talking about today. Now raise your hand if you know what it is in your life. <laughs> that might go both ways. <laughs> okay, now think about some different types of thorns here. Maybe some emotional thorns. Loneliness, singleness. Uh, depression, anxiety, regrets. These are all emotional thorns. Uh, relational thorns. Now, Doug. Uh, maybe a spouse that's hard to get along with. Certain friends that you got. The ones that always seem to show up at the worst time. And the worst time is when they show up. Because that's when trouble comes in your life. Anybody ever know about that? Like that? Yeah, the ones that you need that don't show up. Uh, an unhappy marriage or a relationship of some kind. Or how about uh, financial thorns? Debt. Who's ever experienced that? I'm not going to look up. Uh, having the wrong job. Nothing makes you any more miserable than that. Uh, being unhappy in your job. Uh, you name it. How about physical thorns? A disability, a chronic illness, something wrong that you just simply have no control over. Your body just turns against itself and there's no explanation for it. Okay, now uh, let's look at verse 7. Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh to buffet me. Okay, you know what your thorn is. And Paul says that there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Okay, underline the word given. If there is something that is given to you, what does that mean? It means it was a gift. Raise your hand, whoever said that. The thorn in the flesh was given to me. So the thorn was a gift. It's a gift that irritates, that bothers, that hurts, that gives you some kind of pain on a constant level. And it was given to you as a free gift. That don't sound like a very good gift that I'd want. 
I don't like that kind of gift. I want blessings. I want money. I want favor. I want prosperity, cars, houses. That's the kind of gifts that I want. But I do not want a thorn in my flesh. Do you? But here in Corinthians, it says very plainly that he was given a thorn in the flesh. And it goes on to say that a messenger of Satan came to buffet me. So now the question. If Paul was the receiver and Satan was the deliverer, who was the giver? I didn't want to say it out loud. So somebody go ahead and say it. God was the giver. That hurts, don't it? I think I had an extremely hard time getting this lesson together, and I think that that's why. I didn't want to face up to the fact that God was the giver of the thorn in the flesh, and he allowed Satan to deliver it. God gave the gift of the thorn of sickness, of regret in your life. How's that even possible? Who's ever done something they regret? That's right. Okay, so raise your hand if you've ever done something you regret. Of course, we all have. Was it God that caused you to do that? No. Okay, we do what we later regret in life. We're sitting around one day, we're thinking, man, I wish I hadn't have done that. How is... Okay, just say we think about that on a constant basis. How is it that God is the giver of that thorn in the flesh? It happens like this. You do it. You then regret it. And Satan keeps bringing it up and bringing it up and bringing it up and bringing it up. And God allows him to do that. Why do you think that is? We're tearing down all of our Civil War monuments, right? If we tear them all down and forget about the Civil War, what's going to happen? We're going to forget where we came from, right? Sometimes God allows these regrets to come back into our life to keep us from doing them again. If you feel regret for doing it, you're more likely never going to do it again. If you forget that you've done it, it was fun. It's going to come back around. So God was the giver of the thorn in the flesh. God gave the gift of regret for past bad decisions in order that we could remember what happened and we won't go back there again. God gave the thorn of sickness. Think about this. Who believes God's a sovereign God? Who knows what that means? Somebody tell us what a sovereign God is. What? He's over everything. He's, he knows what's going on and we're not going to pull the wool over his eyes. He's in control, right? He is in charge. That's exactly what that means. Nothing happens. Nothing happens in your life without God knowing about it. So we use words like luck, chance, fate, and Paul calls them silly superstitions. The other... Uh, a couple of days ago, me and Caitlin were sitting there in the recliner. And she said something about being lucky. And I said, well, you make your own luck in life. And she said, well, I think I'm superstitious. And I said, well, what does that mean? And she thought about it in a minute and she said, well, what does it mean? <laughs> and she was, using, she was calling herself superstitious and didn't even know what the word meant. And I said that you believe that luck or fate or Something like that controls where you're going in life. But I, the truth of the matter is, God controls where we go in life. We can make decisions that affect it, but God's in charge. When God says that you're going to be in a certain place at a certain time, you're going to be there. Right?
Yeah. Well, we all say stuff like that. But the bottom line is, God's the one that's in control. Right? So we use words like luck, chance, fate, and, and these are superstitions. And when Christians use luck, chance, or fate, or this cross on the windshield, you know what they're doing? They're denying the sovereignty of God. You either believe that God is in control of your life or you don't. And there's no in-between. Or we say something like this. The devil's messing with me. Who, who does the devil ever mess with? He messes with me sometimes. Does he you? But does God know about that? Does God allow that to happen? Yep, we'll pull our power from God, won't we? Listen to the next words I've got written down here. Think about Job. <laughs> Think about his life before Satan entered it, was allowed to enter into his life. Uh, he was happy. He was healthy. Job's life was full. And he sacrificed to God daily. He, he believed in God, didn't he? He believed that God was going to keep him that way. Until the day that God said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? As soon as God says, said that about Job, Job's life went in a downward spiral, didn't it? He said, Have you considered my servant Job? And Satan's response was, Remove your blessings from Job, and he'll curse you to your face. Now let me ask you this. If God was to say, Consider my servant Alan, or Doug, what would God be able to say in response to Satan when he said, remove your blessings and he'll curse your name to your face? Are, are we that confident in ourselves? Could God be that confident in us? I'm happy when I'm being blessed. But when the blessings are pulled back, I'm not nearly as happy myself. I, I still try to depend on God and, and pull my strength and power from God, but the honest truth about it is I'm not as happy. I'm not as content. I'm not as faithful. I, it don't seem like when the blessings are being pulled back. But sometimes I think that I pray more. I read my Bible more. I seek after God more. I just can't feel it as much. So maybe I'm doing exactly what God wants me to do. Anybody ever think about that? You know, we, we can look at that two ways. When it happens, and if you're a Christian, it is going to happen. That, that is the soldier is no good unless he's tested. That's right. That's exactly right. And you consider that when you talk about the thorn in the flesh. Yes. What do I need to learn from this? This hurts. This thorn in my flesh, when I try to pull it out, it hurts. It makes, makes the wound bigger. God, what do you want me to, to see from this? Right? Yeah. Yeah. No. Well, we, we all do it. Okay, now, God said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? And Satan said, Remove your blessings and he will curse you to your face. What was God's response to Satan?
He said, do it. Go take his blessings away. Spare his life. But go do it and we'll see what happens. Now that is confidence in a man, a mortal man, right? Remove your blessings from Job and he'll curse you to your face. Go do it and we'll see what happens. God knew all along. In other words, here's the gift of the thorn. Satan, you go deliver it. Now that hurts. He took everything from Job. He took his health. He took his family. He took his home. Everything that he had. And it was all because God said, do it. Now that hurts, doesn't it? Yeah, and Job lost his whole family with the exception of his wife in, in one windstorm. It would be tough. Okay, now think about this. God is sovereign. He's in control. He knows what's going on. He knew what was going to happen to Job. He knows what's going to happen to you. But Satan is a created being. God created Satan, right? That tells me that he's got power over him. Satan can't do anything without asking God's permission. Why, this has been asked countless times, why would an all-powerful God allow a lesser being to do what He's done in your life? To cause the pain that He's caused in your life? The key word there is allow. Because He could have stopped it. Whatever the worst thing that's ever happened to you in your life is, God could have stopped it. Why would he allow that? It would be impossible to learn from it if you never experienced it, right? So Satan can only operate with God's permission. And if God is sovereign and in control, Satan has to operate only by permission. And... Only because God says, do it. So Satan brings this thorn. He puts it in your life. It, he puts it under your skin. It bothers you. It irritates you. It hurts you. And God says, okay. So how do you know what you're facing is a thorn and not something that you just brought on yourself? Let's see here. If it's irritating, like I already gave you the list. If it's irritating, frustrating, it bothers you, and it does it constantly, and you've prayed about it, and it's not went away, then it's a thorn. How do I know this? Because that's what Paul done. Paul said, I prayed about it three times, and God said, no. Now think about looking from our fleshly eyes. Just for example, if, if Paul... Was really nearly blind, like some people say that he was. It, from my point of view, if God had healed his eyes and made his eyes better, he would have had a better ministry. Right? I mean, he would have been able to write. It's well known that Paul traveled with somebody nearly constantly. That He didn't write these words with his hand. He, he told them what to say and they wrote it down. Would it not make his ministry better if... If God had healed his eyes, if that's really what the thorn was, or would it have made his ministry better if he had had a wife and a family to support him, or whatever the fill-in-the-blank part of the thorn is, whatever it is, don't it seem, looking from our mortal eyes, that it would be better if God would take it away? It does, don't it? And yet Paul prayed that God would remove this three times, but it was still there. God said no. It was given to Paul. He prayed about it three times, but he still had the thorn. If you pray about it and God don't take it away, there's a reason for it. And the reason is this. He's not done using it in your life. It's just like Doug said, we have to learn from it. But if we pray about it and it's still there, there's something still there to learn from it. Next question. Why does God give you a thorn? 
Look at verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. The first reason that he gives you a thorn, he wants to open your eyes to new things. Now look all the way back at verse number 2. Chapter 12, verse 2. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth. Paul's talking about himself there in the third person. Such one caught up in the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for man to utter. Now, he first spoke about this, then he spoke about the thorn. That tells me that he experienced all this with the thorn in his life. Paul went to the third heaven, whether physically or spiritually, he, he admitted that he didn't know. He describes it as undescribable, as a revelation. But what it was, is it was beyond normal. It was beyond average. And all this happened while he still had the thorn in his life. The thorn in his flesh. What if he hadn't had the thorn? He might not have been able to have been given this revelation. Sometimes we spend all of our time trying to rid ourselves of the thorn. And we stay focused on the thorn instead of focusing on God and the reason that he allowed it in our life. The second thing that the thorn done in Paul's life is it rid him of his self-sufficiency. Now look back at verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations. Now he just told us about that God took him to the third heaven, to paradise. And yet the first sentence in that verse says, and lest I should be exalted above measure. In other words, I'm not going to exalt myself. I'm not going to Brag that God showed me these things. And to keep me from doing that, God's gave me this thorn to remind me that He's the one that done it. It rid him of his self-sufficiency. And at the end of the verse, it said, says that I should be, lest I should be exalted above measure. Paul is saying, when I was given the undescribable revelation, the thorn reminded me that I'm nothing more than a man. It reminded me that I'm weak. It caused me pain and therefore kept me from exalting myself. It made me realize that God is the giver of the revelation and that he's the creator of heaven and that he's the creator of paradise and he's the creator of Satan, that God and God alone is the creator of all things. God can give me a gift. God can give me the, a thorn and he can give me the gift of the thorn. And also, he can take it away from me when he's done teaching me through it. It simply rid Paul of his self-sufficiency. So now I've got the thorn. It hurts. It won't go away. And I don't see any revelation. How do I continue on with this thorn in my life? Look at verse 8. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart for me. The first thing that Paul done was he prayed about the thorn and asked God to remove it. But what did God say? He said no. So then what? Look at verse 9. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So God didn't grant his request to remove it. But he did meet his need. So when we pray, we need to know always that God hears us, just like Sid was talking about a while ago. Now the answer could be no. It could be not yet. It could be wait. But it's not always yes. But while you wait, you'll learn a lesson about the greatest word in the Christian vocabulary. And that's called grace. Jim, 
What's the definition of grace? Grace is God giving you something that you cannot get yourself. Undeserved kindness. He's giving you what you don't deserve. It's as simple as that. And I like this. It's God's goodness running over you. God chooses not to give you your, your request to remove the thorn, but He instead chooses to give you grace concerning the thing. Not only grace, but sufficient grace. That's what He says right there. When does God give grace? When you pray. Paul prayed and he got an answer. And it was not the answer that he wanted, but it was what he needed. It was sufficient for the thorn that he was experiencing in his life. Now listen to this. There is no thorn that you're enduring or that you're going to endure for which there is not sufficient grace. In other words, whatever it is, whatever the thorn is that God chooses to let Satan place into your life, God gives it, Satan delivers it, and it's placed in your life. There is no situation where there's not enough grace to more than cover that. So God made a way out there, didn't he? That's exactly right. But if we're not careful, we'll focus, just like we said a while ago, on the thorn. We'll focus on the problem. And we'll focus on getting that yes answer from God that He don't want to give us just yet. And we totally miss the fact that He's placed a sufficient amount of grace in the problem that we have. Now turn back to... Uh, Chapter 9 should be one page back. And we're going to look at verse 8. <coughs> Chapter 9, verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you. That's a good promise right there. That ye always have in all sufficiency and all things may abound to every good work. Now I'm going to read it again. And God is able to make all grace abound in Doug's life, in Shannon's life, in David's life, in Susan's life. All grace. That's a wonderful promise. That you always have in all sufficiency. And that means you're always going to have more than enough. In all things, no matter what that thorn is in your life, you're going to have all grace. It's going to be sufficient. It's going to be more than sufficient and a pile of it besides that. In all things, to every good work, somehow he's going to turn that thorn into a good work in your life. We don't know how he's going to do it. How could God turn sickness into a good work in somebody's life? God knows how he's going to do it. I don't. God is sovereign. He's in control of that sickness. And he can use it however he chooses to use it. But Paul left no question in that verse. He said, God has so much grace that it abounds. It heaps up. It's always sufficient. It does not matter about the situation. It does not matter what the thorn is. He always has you covered. And not only that, you get bonus grace. That means there's more than enough grace to cover whatever your problem is. When you're trying to deal with the thorn and God chooses not to remove it, the first thing we want to do is pull it out ourselves, just like a fish hook. But don't forget, just like that fish hook, when we try to pull it out ourselves, it's going to tear the hole bigger. It's going to make the wound worse. Whatever the problem is, when we mess with it ourselves, we make it worse. And that sure don't sound like much fun to me. Instead, we've got to look for grace. When did he get grace? When he prayed three times concerning the thorn. The grace was not applied until he asked. The bottom line is this. The difference between a defeated Christian and a victorious Christian, when they both had the same thorn, 
is the victorious Christian is experience, experiences grace and the defeated Christian refuses to. One is focused on the thorn, the other is focused on God's grace. Now, what time is it? In that book that I read part of, that Billy Graham wrote, he told this story. He said that he'd been preaching somewhere and he was in a hurry to get home. He said it was in the southern town, he didn't give the name. And he said, I was speeding through that town. And he said, I got pulled over and the policeman walked up and he said, you're going 10 miles an hour over the speed limit. And he said, in, it evidently was years and years ago, at that time you had the choice to either set a court date or go to court at that time and pay the fine. And he was out of state, so he chose to go right then and pay his fine. And they took him to court. And uh, the judge was up there and he walked up and he said, you've been charged with going 10 miles an hour over the speed limit. And how do you plead? And Billy Graham said, I plead guilty. I was going 10 miles an hour over the speed limit and I'm here to pay my fine. And the judge looked at the name on the ticket and heard his voice and he did have that distinct voice and he said are you the evangelist Billy Graham he said yes sir I am and he said the judge stood up and walked to wherever you go to pay your fine and pulled ten dollars out of his pocket which was the fine one dollar for every mile per hour over the speed limit that he was going and he said Mr. Graham you were speeding but I'm going to pay your fine for you not only that if you're willing, I'm willing to take you out this evening and buy you a steak dinner. And Billy Graham said that was a perfect picture of grace. That his fine was paid. Not only that, he got a steak dinner out of the deal. Who's ever went to court and the judge bought you a steak dinner? <laughs> well, that happened to Billy Graham. And it happens to you. Because God's willing to buy you that steak dinner in your life after grace has been applied in it. When God lets you see grace... When he gives you what you don't deserve, he says the thorns are there. The thorn that you're fussing about, the thorn that's causing you pain, the thorn that's causing this attitude that's hurting you. It's there to do work in your life for some reason and my grace is sufficient. When you focus on grace, the thorn becomes like an IV. Now that fish hook hurts and when you pull it out, it tears the hole bigger. But when God puts the thorn in there, he puts medicine through it. Does it hurt when you get an IV? Yeah, it does. But does the medicine make you better? Yes, it does. When you focus on grace, that's the kind of thorn that you've got. Alan, go ahead and pray for us.